The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. The next presenter is uh, Chad, Chad Mathis. Um, he's a senior executive with more than 20 years of experience in the construction of highways, bridges, power, building, airport, and water projects. He's a qualified construction management professional with the history of leadership that drives creative solutions for key issues following careful research, analysis, and planning. As Executive Vice President, Chad oversees all of Dragados' projects in, in the Southwest and pursuits and estimating efforts in the Western U.S. Chad holds a BS degree uh, in construction management from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is also my uh, alma mater. Thanks. Okay, today uh, I'll be talking a little bit about our SR99 project, the Alaska Way Viaduct Replacement. Um, we'll be focusing mainly on the uh, the tunnel portion of the of the project, but I'll go a little bit over an overview of the project. Talk about a little bit of the board tunnel. Get into the manufacturing of the precast liner system. Um, a little bit about the logistics of the tunneling itself, and then finally finish up with the interior structure of uh, of the tunnel. So for a project overview, um, the, the original Alaska Way Viaduct, which is a currently a double-decker steel structure uh, that goes through downtown Seattle uh, along the waterfront, was built in the early 50s. Um, unlike some of the freeways around here, it's still congested, but the average uh, vehicle count was, is about 110,000 vehicles per day. For a two-lane highway double-decker, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of traffic. Um, what prompted the project that we're actually constructing right now, in, um, in 2001 there was a 6.8 earthquake that hit Seattle that caused some damage to the structure. Um, the structure also had some deterioration already and then this prompted some further investigation. So there was a lot of studies that went into and what could be done with the, with the structure itself. The ultimate solution that the DOT and the government came up with in 2009 was to go to a board tunnel uh, section to ultimately uh, replace the, uh, the current viaduct. Um, so what led to that? The procurement itself, it was done on a design-build contract basis. The bid date for the project was 2010. Um, we were awarded the $1.3 billion contract to build the project in uh, 2011. Uh, the project is a joint venture between Dragados USA and Tudor Perini, the lead designer on the project was HNTB. So a little bit of the scope of work that we'll look at. Um, the tunnel itself, it's a 57 foot diameter tunnel, um, approximately 9,000 lineal feet. It had about a million cubic yards of excavation that came out of the tunnel itself. It includes the north and south uh, portals going in and out of the tunnel. A little over a half a million cubic yards of excavation there, including the Surrey walls, sea camp piles, and a few other things. Included the two operations buildings. There's one on the north and the south. Um, within the operation building is also the vent plants and all the mechanical equipment that goes to operate the tunnel. Um, it included all the tunnel systems, so we had to do electrical, fire life safety, all the SCADA systems and everything else that goes into the tunnel. That's ultimately, I don't know if it works, but that's what the, on the right, what the ultimate configuration of the tunnel. So basically we're building a tunnel, which is just a shell, and putting the freeway down through the middle of it. So a little bit of history of the tunnel. Just if you guys don't know, the uh, Alaska Way Viaduct is the largest board tunnel to date in the world. Um, like I said, it's a 57 foot diameter, so just to give you some scale of that, if you're standing in a six-story building, looking out, that would be the top of the TBM if it was resting on the floor. Um, just to show you the progression of tunnels uh, through some of the time, in 1990, we were doing 21-foot diameter tunnels. In 94, went up to 31-foot diameter tunnels. 
In uh, 2002, we had a project in Barcelona that reached uh, just shy of 40. And then in 2005, uh, we had just close to a 50-foot diameter tunnel. And then in 2010, 2011, uh, the 57-foot diameter. The TBM was manufactured in Japan. It was a joint venture uh, with a Hitachi company. Um, the total length of the machine, if you look at the head of the, from the front of the cutter face all the way through the trailing gear to the back, it's uh, 368 feet in length um, with a weight of 7,000 tons. The, uh, the machine being manufactured in Japan, the project itself is right near the port of Seattle, so logistically worked out well. They were actually able to manufacture in larger pieces. And when they broke it down at the plant, we put it onto uh, shipping, and then it was brought right to the port and transported right into, uh, into the project, into a launching pit. So here's a couple pictures of uh, inside the tunnel. So the picture that's on the upper left, that's, at the, uh, that's where the TBM was launched. But just to give you some scale, you can see the guys walking in the bottom. That, the yellow tube that's on the top, that's a 10-foot diameter vent. Uh, vent tube and then the off to the right is the mucking system that came out top right that was the uh, at the north portal where we broke through and then that's Bertha sitting at the uh, at the north portal and uh, once we were done I don't know if you guys go on YouTube watchdot has some really great videos um, they show the breakthrough and everything like that they've done a really good job of uh, showing progression of the project so the tunnel liner themselves, uh, the tunnel liners were ma manufactured in Puyallup, Washington uh, with a Dragados company and a local company called Incon. The uh, precast segments themselves, um, they're six foot in length, about three foot uh, wide. It takes about ten of those segments to make one ring to go all the way around. Uh, each, each one of them is uh, 170 tons. Just shows you the magnitude of them. These are the largest manufactured uh, precast that went into any tunnel itself. You can see in the, the picture in the middle was where we had to do a test ring and uh, to, to prove out, and then the rest of them were manufactured there. So just for the, the concrete guys and the cement guys here, the, the, con the precast segments themselves, it was a 7,000 pound mix. Um, it was a maxi cement. cement it was a blended hydraulic cement. Uh, LaForge North America was the supplier for the project. We used two main admixtures in the uh, in the segments themselves: a water reducing agent, and then we had a micro silica fume. So the concrete that went into the uh, the precast segments themselves, uh, roughly 116,000 cubic yards. So each ring, the 10 that go around, was uh, 81 cubic yards of concrete itself. It's a picture of them at the precast yard, and then also being hauled inside the tunnel there on the right. So again, tunnel logistics being uh, manufactured in Walla. The, uh, the segments, because of their weight, we had to build uh, special transports to hold the weight and get them up to the, the project site in Seattle. So they were loaded at the precast facility, they were trucked up to uh, downtown Seattle. Once they got to the porthole, they were, uh, we used a 56 ton gantry system to take them off of the, off of the, uh, off of the vehicle, lower them down into the tunnel, and then they went on the transport carrier that you can see on the right to haul up to the back of the TBM machine. Once they get up to the TBM machine, inside we had a specially built system, it's a vacuum system that would clamp onto the segments themselves, pull them inside the tunnel, and then when it was pushed to the front of the TBM machine, it had another vacuum system, and it was a rotating arm that went around in, in the fashion of the circle, and it would place the segments as you went around. So this just gives you a little logistics of where everything was. Um, so Pulalip is down at the bottom where we had our manufacturing plant and then the circle in the middle, that's downtown Seattle where we had the, that's where the project location is. So when you got to about 1.5 million cubic yards of dirt to get rid of in downtown Seattle, it's not the, the easiest thing to do. 
So actually what we came up with for this job, the, all the material was barged out. Uh, again, utilizing the location to the port. That earlier uh, slide I showed you that had the, the, the belt at the top on the right, that's how all the muck comes out of the tunnel. So it was taken out of the tunnel, belted across, and into the port facility. You can see the picture there on the right. From that port facility, we loaded it onto a barge, and then it was barged up to an old quarry that was near, I don't remember the name of the little island, but uh, from the quarry there, it was offloaded, and then they loaded it, in, uh, it's filling up the quarry there. So Logistically, it worked out very well because it took all the potential truck traffic if you guys have ever driven that area or been in the Seattle area, um, not a very good place to be driving around. So in this case, it eliminated all the use of uh, having to use on-highway trucks. The lower left is a picture of the offloading facility that we had up at the, uh, at the old quarry. So just a little more pictures on getting the material out. That's a close-up of the, uh, that's at the south portal, that's at the, at the actual port itself, where it's belted in and then we loaded it onto the barges uh, going out. So I'll touch real quick just on the in instrumentation and monitoring. So this is during construction. Uh, one of the most important things when you're tunneling is what's happening at the surface um, and you don't want to cause any issues. The yellow line is the actual alignment of the tunnel itself. All of the shaded pink, those are buildings that we went under. So if you can imagine, we're boring a six-foot story building underground through downtown Seattle underneath all the buildings. So a lot of concern about what could happen or what could potentially happen. A lot of care has taken place every day with the pre-work plan of what we're going to impact, how the machine is operating, and what to expect as you go. I'm happy to report that this is one of the most successful tunnels in the industry that's been done so far. Not only being that diameter, but we had all, every monitor and every parameter that was set, we were well under, um, which was, was uh, the guys that were, that were mining did a fantastic job. Uh, just a few specs on the actual monitor itself. So inside the tunnel, like I mentioned earlier, we had two, uh, two operations building. So the tunnel ventilation, it's operated by 17 different vent fans, uh, jet fans that go through. There's 188 tunnel dampers uh, on the upper deck and lower deck as you go through. Uh, the tunnel lighting, roadway uh, lighting, fluorescent lighting, and the emergency evacuation. The dampers in the lower is a picture on the right. The evacuation tunnels are on the left. So the fire protection that went in had a diff uh, several different systems. There was a spray fire protection system, a roadway deluge system, a roadway heat detection system, and a wet sprinkler system in all the auxiliary areas. Uh, tr we also are installing all the traffic control, which includes the SCADIA, the ITS system, uh, the communications, and uh, future tolling if uh, WatchDot chooses to toll it. So once the tunnel was done, this is the portion that's in construction right now, which is nearing completion. So we had to build the freeway now inside the tunnel. This is all mainly uh, cast in place construction except for the bottom slab, which is uh, done with precast panels. Each of the different colors that you'll see was the, the sequencing that we went through in the installation of the concrete. We used a Perry formwork system, and here shows the sequence. We started with the corbels on the bottom, moved into the, the lower sidewalls going up, then we poured the upper deck. The last picture on the right, we started the, uh, the panels for the evacuation areas. Once that was done, we went to the, uh, the upper walls, and then the final stage will be to come back and place the PCAST panels on the, for the lower roadway deck. There's a picture of the Perry work system that we used. Another picture of the uh, fire proofing. So the concrete that went into the actual, these are the, uh, for the interior structure, if you remember there's 116,000 cubic yards of concrete that went into the segments themselves, the precast liner. 68,000 cubic yards of concrete that's going into uh, the structure that's going through the tunnel. 
also the north and uh, south portals, and just shy of 14 million pounds of rebar. The concrete that went into the, uh, the that's being used inside the tunnel ranged from about a 5,000 to upwards of 10,000 psi concrete. Uh, there was nothing too spectacular about it. Here's a couple of pictures of the tunnel in, under under construction. So again, you can see this is early where we're starting the corbels on the upper left hand side right there. The uh, the pipes that you see on the right, those are all for temporary. <laughs> Um, that all those pipes run up to the front of the TBM machine, uh, taking in water, all the different uh, admixtures and different things that went to the machine. There's a picture of the scaffolding put in to uh, do some of the fireproofing. So this is at the launch pit. This is the south end of the uh, of the entrance to the tunnel. So this is where the TBM was launched from. So now we're building out. Uh, for the entrance to the tunnel itself, which this will be the, the bottom and the top freeway coming in. So this is again, that's is that same picture, just a follow-up of what it will look like at the end. With the north and southbound traffic, you can see the vent plant uh, just ahead of it and then heading into downtown. This is a picture of uh, the northbound tunnel, of the, the exit at the north. This is during uh, early construction before the TBM machine made it, and it shows it where it's uh, at earlier last year. Another picture of the northbound portal tunnel right there. And that's ultimately what it could look like when we're all done. These are renderings from uh, off the washtop website. So that would be the elimination of the viaducts gone now, and the tunnels in full operation, and then potentially uh, the build out of downtown. And we'll save questions, I guess, for the end. So, thanks.